ادع الى سبيل ربك بالحكمه والموعظه الحسنه وجادله بالتي هي احسن ان ربك هو اعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله We started off with the tafsir, with the explanation of Surah Al-Alaq. Surah Al-Alaq, the first uh, parts of revelation that were revealed to the Messenger wasallam when he was in the cave of Hira in Mecca. And in our previous lecture, we talked a little bit about the virtues of the Surah. We talked a little bit about the history the Asbab al nuzul of the first five verses and we read the hadith which Imam al-Bukhari mentions in his Sahih, the very long hadith, the hadith of Aisha in which she explains when the messenger was in the cave and وسلم, he saw the angel Jibreel and then he went back to Khadijah and he was very frightened and startled and this was the beginning of uh, the, the revelation that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was receiving. So we'll start off reading uh, the first five verses. So this surah, okay, if we look at this surah and we try to break it down, if, if we can break it down into three different parts. Okay, three different parts, three different sections. Okay, the first section is from verses number one to five. The first section is verses number one to five. Okay, then the next section is from verse number 6 to verse number 8. And then the third section is verse number 9 all the way until the end of the surah. So after, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. Allah subhanahu wa taala he tells us in the Quran ordering the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was in the cave of Hira read in the name of your Lord who created all that exists. So the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa taala ordered the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to do. And all of his ummah is read, is to acquire knowledge. And we talked about the different types of knowledge that the human being has been blessed with the faculties and been able to acquire. There is knowledge which is in written form, okay, through revelation. There's also knowledge which is received through recitation, okay. And we talked about what did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read, when the angel Jibreel came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read? The Prophet, he said in the hadith, he said what? Ma ana biqari. Iqra, <laughs> the angel Jibreel said Iqra, then he said Ma ana biqari. I am not of those who know how to read. So did the angel Jibreel Alayhi Salam recite something to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or did the angel Jibreel come and show the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that he could read or recite off of that thing which was written. We know that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was Ummi. He was what? He was illiterate. He was unlettered. As Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala talks about him in the Quran, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا okay? Allah is the one who sends to the unlettered, the illiterate people, a messenger. Okay? So, we have some narrations which are attributed to some of the tabi'een, which mention that when the angel Jibreel actually came down, he was holding a piece of fabric, holding something in front of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and showing it to him, and then ordering the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam to read. Okay? So, the recitation, actually the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, he was learning the recitation of the Qur'an, which was being read to him from the angel Jibreel alayhi salam. Okay? Iqra bismi rabbika. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, we talked about this last week, right? Why did Allah say, bismi rabbika, and he didn't say bismi ilahika? 
for Rububiya. Okay, because remember now from the eloquence and the beauty of the Quran, the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that Allah addresses the people, okay, and knows their situation and know what speech will have the best effect on them. The people in Mecca at that time, they already believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Lord, as the creator, as the sustainer. The one who creates, they already believed in that, but they had a problem in directing their worship only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So when you ever give somebody da'wah or you want to call somebody to the truth, you should always start with that thing which is already ingrained in their natural disposition, ingrained in their natural inclinations, in their hearts, so that they will be more attentive and more receptive to the message that you are going to call them to. Okay, and from okay, Iqra bismi rabbika. Okay, read in the name of your Lord. And also, this is another reminder to the Prophet Muhammad SAW to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beautiful names and beautiful characteristics. Walillahi asma'ul husna fadu'uhu biha. Right, he said, read in the name of your Lord. Remembering all of the characteristics and traits and other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from amongst those things which are related to Ar-Rabb, to the Lord, is what? Alladhi khalaq, that He creates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. Okay, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was what? Al-Arsh. Right? Allah khalaq al-qalam wa kana arshuhu al al ma. It's different narration. Some without that mentioning arshuhu al al ma, right? It just says awwal awwal ma khalaq Allah hu al qalam, right? Fi ba'd al riwayat, right? So the first thing Allah subhanahu wa taala created was His throne, and His throne was on water. So that means water was already created before that. Then Allah created the pen, and He said to it, "What? Write everything that's going to happen in the creation." Okay, so in this first verse, Allah, He didn't say, He didn't tell us, He didn't tell us, or He didn't tell the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, what He created. Why is that? Any wisdom behind that? Why didn't Allah, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not say what He created? Did the people in that time already know that? No. no. Yes, they did. Right? They already knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all of those things, right? Afkur ba'd al ayat al Quran. La in sa'altahum. Man khalaq al samawati wal ardi. Yakulun Allah. Right? Many verses like this in the Quran, right? Al istifham al taqriri, they call it. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the mushrikeen with these type of questions, with these type of questions which they already know the answers to inside their hearts. They already know Allah, He's the Creator. They already know Allah created everything. So the first verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Messenger وسلم, was number one, a reminder to him. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he already knew this. This is why he was going up to the mountain to meditate. He knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. And he was pondering, well, why my people, they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything too. Why won't they worship Him alone? They had a problem worshiping Him alone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu so that he can remind his people as well, to wake them up, right? Allah, He created. Allah, He is the Rabb, He is the Lord, He is the one who created. Okay? خلق الإنسان من علق now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes into detail. And this is from the beauty of the Qur'an, right? You have some verses Allah, right, will mention, right, mujman, right, will mention just general verses. And then you'll find other verses which actually go on to explain in detail what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, okay? So Allah, He created the human being from what? From a alaq. First, He formed him as a nutfa. Okay, what is a nutfa? Okay, the nutfa is the fluid which comes out of the male. Okay, then it goes into the, the womb of the woman. 
Okay? And after it is a nutfa, it forms into a what? An alaqa. What is an alaqa? An alaqa, an alaqa is a small blood clot. Okay, very tiny, very small. Okay, a very tiny blood clot. Then it forms into a what? Mudakha. Then it forms into right, something that looks like a chewed piece of gum. Then it, it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clothes it okay, with flesh. Okay, and these are the different stages that are mentioned all throughout the Quran in over 19 verses in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right, mentions the different marahil, the different stages that the human being goes through. And the Arabs at that time in Mecca, they knew already, they knew the story of Adam. They knew the story of Adam because it was in the Torah. It was in the Torah. And with their interactions with the people of Ahl Kitab, the people of the books, right, the Jews, they would, right, the Arabs were very knowledgeable about the previous stories and the previous nations and the wisdom of the previous nations, right? So remember now, the Arabs who were in Mecca, they were from the descendants of who? Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was a muwahid, who was one who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So they already knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human beings from what? From a clot. But Allah in the, in the Quran, you find that He mentions in many different verses the different stages that the development of the human being or the creation of the human being took place. First Allah, He created Adam from what? From clay, from dirt, right? Many different, right? Min turab, okay? so, all throughout the Qur'an, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the different stages of development of the human being inside the womb of the mother. Okay? خلق الإنسان من علق So what is the difference between خلق الإنسان من علق أو خلق الإنسان من علقة Okay? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing to all human beings, not just one human being. He's pointing to all human beings to remind them, be reminded, remember what you were created from. You were created from nothing. You were created from despised fluid, water. So how can you not read? How can you not write? How can you not be reminded about the beautiful names and characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? which I mentioned right in the first verse, to remind you, okay? خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقٍ Okay, so and then we said, the alaq is different than the nutfa. The nutfa, okay, it is the first stage then, the alaqa, the alaqa, actually, why do they call it alaq? Alaq means what? Alaqa يُعَلِّكُ تَعْلِيقًا Okay, so alaqa means to stick. So this is what the alaqa actually does inside the womb of the, of the mother. Okay, it sticks to the where? To the, the fallopian tubes and it goes into the, the, the womb and it sticks to the wall. Sticks to the wall and then this is how it forms into a baby. Okay, when a woman has a miscarriage or things like that, this is the, when she may be moving too much or things like this, then the, the alaq, the blood will come out or whatever form that the baby has reached in the womb, it will come out. Okay, so then... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse, Allah he says, Iqra wa rabbuka akram Allah he, he repeated the order, the command to read again. Right? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeat the order to read again? He already said in the beginning, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, Iqra wa rabbuka akram alladhi allama bil qalam. Okay, and the scholars they say, right, that there should be a waqf here. Okay, the scholars of, uh, of Qur'an and Qur'at, they say that after you read that verse, 
or the first word, iqra, that you should stop. Okay, then read, وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمَ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمِ Because that is a, is a qasam. Okay, that is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by Himself. Is swearing by Himself that He is the most generous. So what is the reason? What is the wisdom behind Allah repeating the order to read again? Huh? Okay, Iqra wa Rabbuka al Akram. Why did Allah repeat it in the third verse, right? Iqra bismi Rabbika ladi khalaq, khalaq al insana min alaq, Iqra wa Rabbuka al Akram. The first verse Allah he ordered read, and the third verse Allah ordered read. Why? Is that, does that have any meaning in the Quran? Because you have some people, they, they come along and they say, those like the Orientalists and those who uh, don't understand anything about the Quran or never studied the Quran, they say, right, why are so many words mentioned over and over and over again when they don't have any meaning? So what's the meaning behind that? Why would Allah say it again? For emphasis. Ah, for emphasis. For emphasis and to show the importance of seeking knowledge. For emphasis and to show the importance of seeking knowledge and increasing in knowledge. And we said that knowledge is of different kinds, right? Knowledge which is attained by what? By the intellect, by the eyes, by the ears, okay? By the hawas. You have faculties which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to be able to acquire knowledge from the outside world, right? This is called, right? Ilm al tajribi, right? But you also have things inside you that also teach you things as well, such as what? Instinct. Instinct. What else? Feelings. Emotions. What else? Psychic. Intuition. Intuition. These type of things. Inspiration. Okay? All of these are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pointing to in these, these verses right here. Okay? خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ Remember when I created the insan from a alaq, from a small clot in the womb. Okay? He didn't know anything, right? What does Allah say in the Quran, right? I removed you, or I, I placed you out of the wombs of your mothers and you didn't know anything before I started to teach you, okay? So in the womb, when Allah created you, you didn't know anything. But now I want you to read so that you can learn more and educate yourself more. You see the, the relationship here? How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's trying to remind the people that Allah, He is the one who sends down the knowledge he is the one who you need to read in his name. Okay? Iqra wa rabbuk al akram. So the scholars they say the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Iqra again is to emphasize the importance of reading and increasing in knowledge. Increasing in knowledge, number one, of revelation, of religious affairs, but also increase in knowledge and observe your surroundings and seek as much knowledge as you can from amongst the dunyawi affairs as well. And then Allah said, وَرَبُّكَ akram." Again He repeated, وَرَبُّكَ He didn't say, وَإِلَاهُكَ Okay, why? Reminding the people about those characteristics of الربوبية, of the law, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the Lord, and the Creator, and the one who gives knowledge, the one who gives everything, the one who sustains the creation, the one who gives them and provides for them. But why did Allah say, وَرَبُّكَ akram." And he didn't say, وَرَبُّكَ الْكَرِيمِ We know from Allah's names is what? Al-Kareem. The most generous. Or you could say the, 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 the gracious. The gracious. Okay, you have Kareem. Kareem, somebody who is gracious, right? Abdul Kareem, the servant of the most gracious. But why did Allah use, right? Ism uh, al here. Al-Akram. What's the relationship between the word Akram and the Iqra in the beginning of that verse? Think about it for a minute. Ponder. Tadabbur. Allah ordered the Prophet to read again. Okay, you have the word Kareem, which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives generously, who gives abundantly. But now we have, like for example, ism al tafdil in Arabic, you have the word, for example, you have no, good, better, 
best. The best. Okay? So, Kareem, you would translate it, right? Kareem, without the Alif Lam. Kareem, you could say generous. Right? Al Kareem, the generous. Al Akram, the most generous out of all of the creation. Nobody is as generous as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? What's the relationship between the repetition of Iqra and Al Akram? Huh? Okay, Allah the most generous. The more you read, the more Allah will be generous with you. The more you increase in knowledge, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bestow upon you His generosity. So the less you read, Allah is not going to be as generous with you in helping you acquire and attain knowledge of the deen. Okay? So that's the relationship between the repetition of Iqra wa Rabbukal al-Akram. Al-Akram. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on the next verse. Alladhi allama bil qalam. Okay? Who has taught writing by the pen. Or has taught man by the pen. Okay? So who was the first person to write? Who was the first person to write? Who was the first person to write? Some of the scholars say that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended was Adam. Okay? Some of the scholars, they say that the first person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended, right? الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَهُ Who did he teach? Who did Allah teach to, to write first? Some of the scholars say Adam alayhi salam. Okay? This Lianahu Awul Man Katab. Okay, and this is what Ka'ab al Ahbar, one of the one of the companions said. Okay. The second okay, opinion is that it was Idris alayhi salam. Okay, who was Idris? Which prophet was he? When did he come? He come before Nuh or after Nuh? After Nuh. Idris come after Nuh. Sure. We have a book over there, The Prophets. One of the young guys, go get it. Muhammad al make sure. So Idris either came before Nuh alayhi salam or after Nuh. But he came after Adam. Okay, he came after Adam. Over there, The Prophet stories. Okay. Tayyip. The third statement, okay, the third opinion, right? أَنَّهُ أَرَادَ كُلُّ مَنْ كَتَبَ بِالْقَلَمْ لِأَنَّهُ مَا عَلِمَ إِلَّا بِالْتَعْلِيمِ اللَّهِ لَهُ Yeah, that one, Stories of the Prophets. Should mention, it should have them in categorical order, right? You read it and tell us, okay? وَجَمْعَ بِذَلِكَ بَيْنَ نِعْمَتِهِ تَعَالَى عَلَيْهِ فِي خَلْقِهِ وَبَيْنَ نِعْمَتِهِ تَعَالَى عَلَيْهِ فِي تَعْلِيمِهِ اِسْتِكْمَالًا لِي نِعْمَةَ عَلَيْهِ So, these scholars, right, there's three opinions. That the one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was intending was who? Was Adam alayhi salam, the second opinion is that it was Idris alayhi salam, and the third opinion is that it was general for all people, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching all people to write, okay? And there is actually, there is a narration, okay? There is a narration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not a hadith, okay? It's not a hadith, but it is a narration which some of the companions... Okay, or no, actually it is a hadith. Okay, it is a hadith. Rawa Abu Idris al Khawlani an Abi Dharra Zifari Kala Kultu Ya Rasulullah. Kam kitab al Anzal Allah Ta'ala. Kala mi at the Sahifa ten wa arba at the Kutubin. Anzal Allah Ta'ala ala Adam Ashara Sahaif. Wa ala Sheath Hamsina Sahifa. Wa ala Idris Dalatina Sahifa. Wa ala Ibrahim Ashara Sahaif. So there is a narration, okay, um, the, the authenticity of this narration, there is some dispute amongst the scholars, okay, but it says, okay, that Abu Dhar al-Ghifari went to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and he asked him, he says, O Messenger of Allah, how many books were revealed in all? How many books, how many parchments, how many revelations were revealed in all? And he said, there were... 100, okay, there were 100 sahifas, 104, or excuse me, 100 sahifas, or you can say 100 parchments, okay, 100 parchments, and 4 books, okay, what we know about in the Quran is what, we know about 
The book, we know about the Quran, Al Furqan, we know about what? We know about Injil, we know about the Torah, we know about the Zabur. Allah mentions in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we also know about in Surah Al A'la, Suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa. So we know for sure in the Quran that Musa and Ibrahim alayhi salam received some form of revelation. The Sahifa, most likely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was referring to the Torah, but Ibrahim alayhi salam. As we have in this hadith, we have in the Quran that he received actually some revelation, right? It could have been in written form that he wrote himself, okay? Or it could have been in a recitation form, or it could have been revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already written and preserved for him. So, this narration says that Adam received 10 parchments, okay? 10 parchments or 10 scrolls, okay? And sheaf who was from the offspring of Adam السلام, received 50 scrolls. Idris received 30 scrolls. Ibrahim received 10 scrolls. And then the Torah, the Injil, the Zabur, and the Fulqan were revealed. Okay? So this here, الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمْ So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's reminding the human beings, He's reminding us from the, the ways, the wasail, لِإِكْتِسَابِ الْعِلْمِ بَعْدَ الْوَسَاءَلْ إِكْتِسَابَ الْعِلْمَ النَّافِعِ Is what? Is through the pen, through writing. The revelation of the Prophet Muhammad wasn't preserved except through what? Two ways. Memorization and writing. Memorization and writing. And then when, in the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, how, were the, how was the Qur'an actually copied? They didn't have copy machines. They didn't go to FedEx or Xerox or Staples and copy, you know. No, what did they do? Right? They preserved it through through writing. And these are the two most beneficial means and ways that an individual can learn. Is through what? Number one, reading or listening to recitation and repeating after that individual. How do kids learn? In the beginning, they don't acquire the knowledge of how to read and write. Not until they're six, five, you know, even some even younger like this, if their parents train them and things like this. But they learn, right, a different kind of, right, I guess you can say talqeen, talqeen, right? When they, how do they learn how to speak? When they listen to their parents, right? When they hear their parents talking, when they hear their friends talking, they repeat the same thing that they've heard, okay? Then when they get older, they learn how to read and learn how to write, learn how to write, okay? So, think about the relationship here. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقِ اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمِ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بِالْقَلَمِ In that verse where Allah he says, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقِ He created man from a clock. He created him from nothing. He created him from dirt. Okay, from despised fluid. Then changed him through the different stages. Okay? He didn't know anything, right? He didn't know anything. But then from the bounties and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He teaches him with what? With how to read, iqra, and how to write. Reading and writing. So this also is another miracle of the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was ordering the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and encouraging his ummah to remove right, the illiteracy from your ummah. And encourage your ummah and your followers to be from the most knowledgeable of people and the most knowledgeable of individuals. And the, and the best tools that they can use to attain knowledge, number one, knowledge of Allah, knowledge of the Rabb, knowledge of Alladhi Khalaq, is by reading and by writing. Okay? Then Allah he goes on to say, right? عَلَّمَ insana مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ then Allah he goes on to say that He's taught the human beings that which they did not know. They didn't know anything. Okay? So what is intended here? Okay? What is intended here? When the human beings, when Allah created them into a alaq, a clot, and they came out of, right? Uh, came out of the wombs of their mothers. They didn't know how to do anything. Okay? What are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to point to in these verses here that He taught the human being? Some scholars say, okay, Al-Khattu Bil-Qalam. 
Okay, the things that Allah taught them, that taught human beings, الذي علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم He taught the human beings that which they did not know, how to read, and how to what? And how to write. Okay? And other scholars, they say, علمه كل سنعة علمها فتعلم Okay? Other scholars say that Allah taught them everything that they know. All of the crafts, all of the professions that they knew, carpentry and, and uh, iron working and you know, where did Dawood learn how to right, be an iron worker, how to bend you know, iron and make swords and make shields and things like this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him. And he gave him right, special abilities to be able to bend the iron with his hands and things like that. But these were things that were passed down from generation to generation. People have been, you know, welding and things like that for many years. Okay? And also there is another explanation of that verse. Okay? Okay? That he taught the human being in the beginning of his creation. That which he can use, okay, to prove his creation and how he moved from different stages throughout his life. Okay? So that's the first section. Okay, that's the first section of this surah, Surah Al-Alaq. He said, Surah Al-Alaq, if you look at it and break it down and analyze it, you can break it down into three parts. So if we were to summarize these first five verses here, what would you summarize that the topic of these five verses is about? Knowledge and Number one, knowledge. Acquiring knowledge. The importance of acquiring knowledge. What else? That we get it from Allah. That we get it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anything that you do, any type of knowledge that you want to acquire, if you want to be blessed in that knowledge, iqra bismi rabbika. Read in the name of your Lord. Say the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and think about the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything that you read and everything that you write. Okay? So that's the first part. So this part is telling us about the importance of the Risalah. The importance of learning the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? The importance of learning the revelation and being observant to everything around us. Alright? Then the next part, the second part where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى أَرَّآهُ اسْتَغْنَى إِنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الرُّجَعَى Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he goes on to say, Nay, verily man does transgress against all bounds in disbelief, in sins, in evil deeds, all types of bad things. Okay? أَرَّآهُ اسْتَغْرَى Because he considers himself self-sufficient, that he doesn't need anyone. <coughs> Inna ila rabbika ruj'a and surely unto your Lord is the return. Okay? So now in this part, these three verses here, which is the second part of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this very harsh language. Okay? Very harsh language. Remember we said, right? Some of the words to know that a surah is Mecki is the language that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses. One of the words was what? Kalla. Right? Kalla. Nay. Can translate it or verily or indeed right showing extreme emphasis that human beings okay when human beings transgress the ground the, the, the bounds so the word comes from the word what taga taga al ma okay that the, the water overflowed or it went over the boundaries or he exceeded the boundaries or he exceeded the limits okay so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there are individuals, there are human beings who exceed the bounds, who exceed the limits, who go away from what Allah they want. They don't have now. They can do whatever they want with their money. They can bribe this politician, they can bribe that one, bribe the imam, do this one, give this one some rishwa. Okay, buy anything they want, invest into haram, things like this. They have no boundaries. That's one wasila. Men wasa'ala tughiyan. Another is al ansar. Your friends, your supporters, your advocates. When you have a lot of friends, 
when you have a lot of supporters, you have a lot of followers, you're untouchable, you think. You think nobody can touch you. That you are the man. You can exceed all limits and do whatever you want, and nobody can do anything to you. Okay? Another type of tughyan is what? With knowledge as well. Another type of tughyan is knowledge. Where? تَتَكَبَّرْ عَلَى النَّاسِ Right? You use your knowledge to be arrogant upon people and exceed the bounds and exceed the limits and try to deceive people or mislead people and things like this because they may be naive or they may be ignorant. Okay? Or to oppress people. Okay? This is another type of tughyan, to oppress people or transgress against people. Okay? So Allah, He's mentioning here that these are the normal characteristics for many of human beings. Generally speaking, all people, they exceed what? They exceed the boundaries and exceed the limits. But there are some who do not. Okay? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning this, He's saying, right? Al-Aghlabiyya, right? Al-Aghlabina yaqa'u fi tuqyan. Right? The majority of the people, right? They fall into this type of exceeding of the limits. Okay? And Allah says in the Quran, right? Inna lamma taghalma. Right? And there's another uh, example from the word, right? When the water rose. Okay? So this is what the word, right? Kalla inna insana la yatagha. That he, that he exceeds the limits. That he exceeds the limits. Okay? Arra'ahu staghna. So here is the relationship between one and the other. Okay? At-tughyan and al-istighna. What is the relationship between the two? Okay, at-tughyan, as I said, right? Taghalma means exceed the limits. Al-istighna means that you consider yourself self-sufficient. You don't need anybody. You don't need anyone. You do everything by yourself. Nobody helps you. Nobody aids you. Okay? So what's the relationship between, right? كَلَّا إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَا يَطْغَى أَرْرَآهُ اسْتَغْنَى Is there any relationship between those two verses? So Allah, remember now, in this part from verses 6 to 8, Allah is talking about the individuals who deny the risala of the Prophet Muhammad And some of the things that make you deny the message of the Prophet Muhammad or deny any of the revelation is what? Is Tughyan. Is, is what? Exceeding the bounds and exceeding the limits. I'm better than that. I don't need that. I don't need the Quran. I don't need the Sunnah. I do whatever I want to do. I have all this money. I can do whatever I want. I have all these followers. I can do whatever I want. Arra'ahu staghna. Right? So the relationship between somebody transgressing the limits is directly related to somebody considering help self-sufficient. That he doesn't need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that everything that he's earned, everything that he's acquired, everything that he does is from his own hard work. And it has nothing to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? طيب الاستغناه هو في الأصل امتلاك الأشياء التي تجعل مالكها غنيا بها عن غقي وهو لله تعالى وحده فالله عز وجل هو الغني في ذاته بصفات الكمال التي هي له وهو المالك لكل شيء وهو الغني في ذاته عن كل شيء من دونه وقد يكون الاستغناء شعورا نفسيا كاذبا يراه الإنسان لنفسه هو فهو في حقيقة حاله فقير لربه محتاج إليه في كل مطلب من مطالبه وقد جعله ربه محتاج لأشياء كثيرة والله وحده هو الذي يخلقها ويهيئها له ضمن سننه في كونه. So here is like I said, right? The istighna that somebody feels that he's self-sufficient can be in many different aspects. Okay. Whether it's money, whether it's wealth, whether it's followers, okay? And it could be a real type of istighna, okay? A real type of self-sufficiency that somebody attains or acquires, 
Okay, and this type of self-sufficiency that one acquires and attains is only when they are dependent upon who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only self-sufficiency that you can acquire is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, but there may be some istighna kathibah. Okay, there might be some type of istighna, some false feelings of self-sufficiency. Okay, that you may consider yourself to have. Okay, and this is when... Right? Somebody thinks that whatever he does or he has the power to do everything that he wants without the help or without the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So these two verses are directly related. So what we can benefit from our daily lives is what? Whenever somebody wants to exceed the limits, then you will find they will find themselves thinking falsely that they are what? Self-sufficient and they don't need anybody. And the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes on to say, Inna ila rabbika ruja'a. And then surely is your return. Why did Allah want to remind us about that? Or remind the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that, okay, you know, normally human beings, they transgress all grounds. And uh, the reason behind that is because he considers himself self-sufficient. He doesn't need Allah. And then he says, Surely unto your Lord is the return. What is the relationship between those three verses? What do... When people normally exceed the bounds, right? And when people, people normally consider themselves self-sufficient, what do they think? I'm not going to die. I'm never going to die. I do whatever I want. I'm never going to meet my Maker. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending another warning to them. Hey, you who think you're self-sufficient, who is transgressing all browns, you are going to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be reminded about everything that you did. And all that took in that you, uh, you caused in the earth. Okay? So that's the second part. Okay, that's the second part of this surah. We said the first part is talking about the virtues of knowledge and seeking knowledge and the importance of following the risala of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second part is about what? Those who deny the risala, those who deny the risala, because of what? Because of istighna and because of a tughyan. Okay. Now the third section, the third section of the surah, is where Allah subhanahu wa taala, okay, from verses nine to nineteen to the end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa taala is saying, "Araayt al-ladhi yanha." عَبَدًا إِذَا صَلَّى أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَانَ عَلَى الْهُدَى أَوْ أَمَرَ بِالتَّقْوَى أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى أَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَى كَلَّا لَإِنْ لَمْ يَنْتَهِ لِنَسْفَعًا بِالنَّاصِيَةِ نَاصِيَةٍ كَاذِبَةٍ خَاطِئَةٍ فَلْيَدْعُ نَادِيَةٍ سَنَدْعُ الزَّبَانِيَةٍ كَلَّا لَا تُتِعْهُ وَاسْجُدَ وَاقْتَرِبْ So here, this section, Okay, what is this section talking about now, brothers? What is this section talking about here? Okay, if we were to translate, okay, Araayta uh, Ladi Yanha. Who is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala talking about here? Araayta, O Muhammad, Muhammad, have you seen? Okay, have you seen the one who is trying to stop you? Have you seen the one who's trying to prevent you? Have you seen the one who's trying to stop the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from worshipping and praying? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about here? Ara'ayta alladhi yanha. Abu Jahl. Okay. Abu Jahl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing Abu Jahl. Who was trying to do what? Trying to stop the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from praying. Okay. And this is actually the sabab of the nuzul of this verse. This is the cause of justification for the revelation of this verse. Because what happened, okay, there's a hadith mentioned in uh, Sahih Muslim and other uh, books of hadith which actually mentioned the story that when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was in the Kaaba, okay, and Abu Jahl, he said, he swore by, he said, Wallati wal Uzza, la in ra'aytu Muhammadan yusalli bayna adharikum, لَأَطَأْنَا رَقَبَتَهُ وَلِعَفِّرَنَّ وَجْهُهُ فِي التَّرَابِ ثُمَّ أَتَى رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ وَهُوَ يُصَلِّي 
ليطأ رقبته فما فاجأه منه إلا وهو ينقص أي يرجع على أقبيه فقيل له ما لك فقال إن بيني وبينه خندقا من نار وهواء وأجنحة فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لو دنا مني لأختتفته ملائكة عضوا عضوا So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was going to pray in the Kaaba Abu Jahl he said I swear by Lat a Lat was a, 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 a idol that they used to worship in Jahiliya okay in the Kaaba he, he said I swear by Lat and Uzza okay the two idols of the polytheists if I see the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praying between us I'm going to step on his neck and I'm going to push his face in the dirt and then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi came out Okay, and he was praying in front of the Kaaba, in front of Abu Jahl and all these people. So then Abu Jahl started walking over to him. And what happened? Abu Jahl, he says himself, okay, he started going, walking towards the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, and then he suddenly started like turning around and running. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, He placed a what? He placed a curtain. Okay, He placed the curtain. Or I guess a trench of hellfire or a curtain of fire, okay, or a trench of fire between Abu Jahl and between the Prophet Muhammad <coughs> Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, he said, if Abu Jahl was to come any closer to me, then the angel would come and he would rip him and tear him to pieces. And, right, Al-Hassan Al-Basri, he said in a narration, he said that, the, uh, he said that, Right. He said that every nation has a Fir'aun. And the Fir'aun of this Ummah is who? Is Abu Jahl. Okay? So this verse was directly related and directly revealed about who? About Abu Jahl. About Abu Jahl. Okay? And if you think about it, those previous verses we just read. Kalla inna al insan ala yatwa, arraahu stagna, inna ila rabbika ruja, araaita ladi yanha. So it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, giving the muqaddima, giving the introduction, okay, now I'm going to tell you about the biggest transgressor and the biggest one who thinks that he's self sufficient. It is who? Araaita ladi yanha. It is Abu Jahl. The one who tries to prevent the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu from praying. Okay? أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يَنْهَا Okay? عَبَدًا إِذَا صَلَّى عَبَدًا إِذَا صَلَّى Okay? So what prayer was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam praying when this situation occurred with him and Abu Jahl? Some of the scholars say that he was praying Salatul Dhuhr. Okay? He was praying Salatul Dhuhr. Alright? حكى جعفر ابن محمد أن أول صلاة جماعة جمعت في الإسلام يوشك أن تكون التي أنكرها أبو جهل صلاها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ومعه علي رضي الله عنه فمر به أبو طالب ومعه ابنه جعفر فقال صلي جناه ابن ابن عمك وانصرف مسرورا and then he said some 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 poetry إن علي وجعفر ثقتي عند ملمي الزمان والكربي والله لا أخذل النبي ولا يخذله من كان ذا حسب لا تخذل وانصر ابن عمكما أخي لأم من بنيهم وأبي فسمع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذلك. so there were so some of the scholars say that the prayer that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم was actually praying okay was the Lord prayer and he was with Ali ibn Abi Talib رضي الله عنه in some of the other uh, narrations and these narrations are marasil, right? Marasil, they're not actually raised narrations to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, so abadan ida salla. Abadan is who? Who is Allah referring to here? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? So Allah called him a what? Abd, a servant, a slave, no one that should be worshipped, no one that should be called upon. No one that should be supplicated to. Allah called him a what? Abd. Abd does what? He obeys his master. The Prophet Muhammad's master was who? Was Allah 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ara'ayta in kana ala al-huda. Okay? Now, these last verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have different categories of people. Different categories of people in regards to the risala. Okay? Different categories of people in regards to the risala. In regards to the message of the Prophet Muhammad and their stance towards the message. The first category is who? Ara'ayta ladhi yanha abadan ila salla. This is the what? This is the category of those when they hear the message. يتكبرون يستكبرون ويتغون على الناس and they don't want to hear the message such as Abu Jahl who is the Fir'aun of the Ummah who said أنا ربكم الأعلى This is the first category of people in regards to the Risala they don't want to hear it they deny it completely okay then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he goes mentioning another category of people أرأيت إن كان على الهدى أو أمر بالتقوى Okay. In this verse right here, okay, some of the scholars say that what is intended was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about who? Abu Jahl. Okay, but Hadha Ba'id. Alright, this is Ba'id. This is far fetched. Okay. Other scholars say that it was who? That it was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? Because أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَانَ عَلَى الْهُدَىٰ أَوْ أَمَرَ بِالتَّقْوَىٰ So it could be understood, right, it is Abu Jahl, right, saying that, okay, well, what would be the situation if Abu Jahl was upon guidance, okay, or if he was ordered with taqwa, or if he was ordered with piety and righteousness, what would be his situation? It would be different than him denying or preventing the Messenger ﷺ from praying, okay? Some of the scholars say, right, هو النبي كان على الهدى في نفسه وأمر بالتقوى في طاعة ربه. That the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم was the one intended in this verse because the Prophet himself he was upon guidance. He never worshipped an idol, right? He never did any of the bad etiquettes or manners that some of the Arabs were known for prior to Islam. And he was ordered with taqwa, with obedience to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. And he what? And he fell into submission and he conveyed the message of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So that's the first category. Okay? The first category of individuals mentioned in this last section. Okay? Tayyip? So there's actually four categories of people in this bunch of verses. Okay? Four categories of individuals. Okay? Number one, مستجيب نفسه متبع ويحمل هم الدعوة إلى هذه الرسالة وهداية الناس إلى الاستجابة لها واتباعها. Okay. السنف الثاني مستجيب بنفسه متبع ولكنه غير مهتم بالدعوة إليه وهداية الناس إلى استجابة لها واتباعها ولا يقوم بهذه وظيفة الشريفة. السنف الثاني مكذب بهذه الرسالة ومكذب للرسول المبلغ لها ومتول مدبر عنها رافض لاتباع ما جاء فيها لكنه لا يحاربها ولا يقاومها ولا يدعو الناس إلى عدم الاستجابة لها والسنف الرابع مكذب يعلن توليه وإدباره ورفضه اتباع ما جاء فيها Okay, so that's the first category that we're talking about here. Okay, أرأيت الذي ينها عبدا إذا صلى. That is the last category that we mentioned here. Those who don't want to listen to the message at all. Okay, أرأيت إن كان على الهدى أو أمر بالتقوى. Okay, that's the second category. Those who what? Those who are guided by themselves. Are guided by themselves. And they have a hamia with dawa. They have the importance of what? Of giving dawa and calling other people to the religion of Islam. Okay? أَرَأَيْتَ إِنْ كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's going back talking about who? Abu Jahl. Have you seen the one who lies, lied to himself and also turned away? Okay? 
Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about here? He's talking about Abu Jahl. What did Abu Jahl disbelieve in? What did Abu Jahl deny or reject? Number one, he rejected what? Quran. Or first Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what? Then the Quran, then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? And he turned his back from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? So, أَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَى That's the next category of people, right? That who, the one who completely turns away from the message and doesn't want to hear it and denies the message and prevents the message from spreading to other people. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to remind us, أَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَى Doesn't he know? Doesn't Abu Jahl know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees him and knows everything that he is doing? Okay? And from this verse right here, we can understand that from Allah's traits and characteristics is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what? He knows everything. And what also? Allah sees. Allah has two eyes. His eyes are not like our eyes. His sight is not like our sight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see a black ant on a black stone in the middle of a, a dark night. There's nothing that blurs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always looking, always observant to us. So Allah has two eyes and they are real eyes. They are real eyes. Okay? But they are not like the eyes of anything from amongst His creation. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ okay. Then, towards the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, كَلَّا لَإِن لَمْ يَنْتَهِ لِنَسْفَعًا بِالنَّاصِيَةِ Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about here? He's using that same type of language now. He's using that same type of language, that very strong language, a tawbih, or a taqeed, okay? That if he doesn't seize, if Abu Jahl doesn't seize from harming you or preventing you from praying, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send angels which will seize him by the what? By the nausea, okay? What is a nausea? A nausea is the part of the front of your head right here, okay? The part of your, the, the front of your head right here, okay? So, what is لَنَسْفَعَمْ بِالنَّاصِيَةِ As-Safa' What does Safa' mean? Safa'ahu Safa'ahu Ah, Latamahu, right? We will smack him in, the, in his nausea We will smack him and we will take him and we will hit him in his nausea, in his forehead, his forelock So what is the significance of the forelock? This part of your head No, okay, we'll get to that after we get to, what is the significance of your forelock? Uh, respect, honor, shut off, right? This is your, your face is like, you know, a noble place. People shouldn't touch your face, people shouldn't hit you in your face. And if somebody hits you in your face or puts their hands in your face, it's a form of what? Disrespect. Okay, so just how Abu Jahl denied the message of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and disrespected Allah and disrespected the messenger, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Jaza'u min jins al-Amal. Right? Al-Jaza'u min jins al-Amal. The same way that his nasiyatin kadiba, right? His forelock, which is a lying forelock, denied the messenger, denied the Quran, denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to send angels that are going to seize you and smack you and hit you in your forelock. Okay? So, Tayyib, uh, al-Nasiyah. Okay, nasiyah is the muqaddim al ras Okay, muqaddim al ras the head, uh, the front of the head. Okay, the front of the head. And also the word nasiyah, right, jaa fi surat al-Rahman. Bayanu anna al-mujrimin yawm al-qiyamati yukhaduna ila dar al-adhabi bi nawasihim wa aqdamihim li qadfihim fiha. وَلَا يَخْفَ مَا فِي هَذَا مِنْ إِهَانَةً وَإِذْلَالَهُمْ فَقَالَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ يُعْرَفُ الْمُجْرِمُونَ بِسِيْمَاهُمْ فَيُؤْخَذُ بِالنَّوَاسِ وَالْأَقْدَامِ So, 
Also on the day of resurrection, you will see that the inhabitants of the hellfire and the criminals and the wrongdoers, what will they be snatched by? What will they be grabbed by? They will be grabbed by their forelocks. They will be grabbed by their forelocks and they will be thrown into the hellfire. Okay? So, tayyib. Uh, let's move on here. So we can, uh, we're going to try to finish up the surah this evening. Surah Al-Alaq. And, uh, and, and, and. Okay. Next verse. Nasiyatin kadibatin khatiyah. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going on to explain what type of nasiyah does Abu Jahl have. And as the brother was mentioned, he said from a scientific perspective. Okay. What is the significance of the forelock here? And in relation to this verse, Allah says, Nasiyatin kadibatin khatiyah. That he has a lying, a sinful forelock. Or here, this part of his head. Scientifically and medically, the doctors and the physicians and scientists say that the part of your brain, the part of your brain that is responsible for lying and telling the truth is where? Is this part of your head, this part of your brain. Okay? And if you look in many of the old uh, cultures and things like that, Egyptian uh, symbology and things like that, the pharaonic symbology and things like this, they always had a serpent, right? If you see any of the kings, they wore crowns or the queens, they would have a serpent right there on their head, symbolizing what? Symbolizing enlightenment, symbolizing knowledge, symbolizing, right, distinguishing between truth and falsehood. So this goes way back, this goes way back, but this is like from the miracles of the Quran. How did, how, how could the Prophet Muhammad know that the part of the forehead which is responsible for lying or telling the truth is the nasiya, is the front of the forehead. This is another miracle from the miracles of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So then, فَلْيَدْعُ nadia. Okay, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging him. Al-Tahaddi. Abu Jahl, you think you're so great, you think you're so tough, you think you can exceed the limits. Okay? You think you can, you think you can, you think you're self-sufficient, you don't need anybody. Call all of your people, call all of your supporters, call Quraysh, call all of your Abu Lahab, call all of them. Call all of them here, gather them up and get them together so that you can try to go against the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And when you call your helpers, what am I going to do to you? What am I going to do to you? Sanad'u Zabaniya. What are Zabaniya? Ah, angels of what? Sanad'u Zabaniya. Az Zabaniya hum al malaika min khazanat jahannam wa hum a'zam al malaika khalqan wa ashadduhum batshan wa al Arab tadlaq hadha ism ala man ashtadda batshuhu. Okay? So the, 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 the Zabaniya, they are the most fiercest, the most strongest, the most toughest of the angels of the hellfire. al jazaa min jins al You see? Abu Jahl, he's the worst of the worst, right? He's the Fir'aun of the Ummah. His Tuhyan took him to exceed all limits, to transgress against everybody, to deny the message of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, to deny Allah, deny the Qur'an. Now he wanted to even hurt the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So what is his jaza? What is his right punishment for that? Before he even goes into the hellfire, what if you try to call your supporters to try to stop this message spreading? Then we're going to call our very fierce and tough angels to come and take you, right? Who the the the, the zabani? They are the guards of the hellfire. Okay, they're very tough and very fierce angels. So. You are only deserving of those type of angels. There's other angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could send, but because of his staunchness and his fierce animosity towards the Prophet Muhammad I'm going to send you my worst people to take care of you. I'm going to send my toughest people to take care of you. You think you're so tough, Abu Jahl? I'm going to send my toughest angels to rip you apart and take care of you. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he finishes the surah saying, Kalla. La tuti'hu wasjuda wa qatarin. Okay? Then, uh, 
finishing up the surah, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He, right, He's, he's telling the Prophet Muhammad said, Do not obey who? La tu who? O Muhammad, do not obey Abu Jahl. Do not follow Abu Jahl. But not only to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, now we have to get it. We have to nawasa al ayah, right? This verse, yes, it was intended by Abu Jahl. But when we study the Quran and learn the Quran, right, we can look at the more. Right? General, the more broader meanings as well. So anybody who has those characteristics, anybody who exceeds the limits, anybody who thinks themselves to be self-sufficient, anybody who tries to stop you from praying, anybody who tries to prevent you from worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what should you do? La tuti'hu. Do not be obedient to Him. Wasjud waqtari. And pray and continue prostrating and continue getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So, this verse, this last verse in the Quran, right? Wasjud wa qatari. Okay? Tayyib. Ahaduhuma. Okay? Wasjud wa qatari. Fihi wajhan. Ahaduhuma. Usjud anta ya muhabad musalliyan. Wa qatarab anta ya abu jahal man al So some of the scholars say that La tuti'hu O Muhammad Do not be obedient to him And O Muhammad make prostration Waqtarib And Abu Jahl He will be closer to what? The hellfire That's one interpretation of that verse One explanation of that verse The second one Okay Usjud anta ya Muhammad Fi salatika li taqarrab min rabbik فَإِنَّ أَقْرَبْ مَا يَكُونَ الْعَبْدِ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِذَا سَجِدَ لَهُ إِذَا سَجِدَ لَهُ Okay? So the second interpretation of that verse is that it was all directed to who? To the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Number one, do not be obedient to Abu Jahl and get closer to Allah by prostration. And the best way to get closer to Allah was Jud wa Qatari. The more you prostrate, the more you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... Uh, so we'll stop here, okay? We'll stop here. So as I said, this surah, okay, we broke it down into three parts, okay? Surah Al-Alaq, 96th surah in the Quran. Go home, review it, ponder over it, contemplate over it. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do, okay? To ponder and contemplate over the meanings of the Quran, okay? We wanted to make this lecture right more interactive so we want feedback so we want our brothers to go home we want them to study bring in some benefits add some other benefits you got from other books of tafsir tafsir ibn kathir tafsir uh, adwa al-bayan or tafsir al-tabri or any of the other books of tafsir we want to discuss these verses so that we can get the reward from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he says that the prophet muhammad sallam told us in the hadith majtama' qawman fi baytin min biyutillah ويتلون كتاب الله ويتدارسونه فيما بينهم إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده. We want to obtain these rewards, and the only way we can do it is if it's right an exchange. Okay, this is called مدارسة القرآن. Okay, how we study and research the Quran together. So we'll stop here. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless all of us. May Allah سبحانه وتعالى increase us in knowledge. Of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So next week, inshallah, we're going to do a quick review of Surah Ta'ala. Then we're going to go into what Surah? Mudathir. Okay. Inshallah, we're going to go and explain the Quran to the best of our ability according to the way it was revealed to the Messenger. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. If a brother wants to call the Anan, Inshallah, you go ahead. It's, it's, it's recommended that you should, when you're reciting the verse for recitation and things like this, it's recommended that you should prostrate. Okay, the brother he asks, he says, when you read the last verse in Surah Al-Alaq, should you make sujood? Okay, if you're reciting the Quran, yes, it's recommended that you should prostrate. And if you're praying and you read it in the prayer, then you right should prostrate as well when you recite that last verse 
from Surah Al Alam. So let's call the Imam, let's pray, and then if there's any questions, inshallah, we'll address them after Isha. Jazakallah khair wa barakallah feek. Subhanaka lahum wa bihamdika shalom wa la ilaha illa anta sallam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.